Good afternoon and welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us for this webinar that will be addressing the uh, OTT growth observes in 2020 during the lockdown. The session is co-organized by Dataxis and Brightcov. And the objective of the presentation is to address the, um, the recent evolutions that were observed in the OTT and streaming industry and to understand uh, the, these trends thanks to the insights uh, that are coming from the actors themselves. Uh, the lockdown that was applied in uh, many countries around the world had consequences uh, in terms of video consumption uh, and uh, non-linear offers that were distributed through the internet suddenly became even more attractive than they uh, were before the quarantine. Our panelists from Brightcove and Watchfor will share their observations on uh, the current state of the OTT video viewing. My name is Saeva Nevier. I coordinate the research at Datexis. Uh, we're a company specialized in market research on uh, TV, telecom, OTT, uh, and uh, broadly speaking, media markets. We also organize conferences that, uh, that have now been moved to digital. And the upcoming conference will be dedicated to sports at the beginning of October. All the information is on our website. I will present a short market overview to introduce the session and provide some elements of context uh, using data access research and data sets. And the goal is to uh, present the video consumption market trends that our analyst team has uh, observed most recently. Our panelists today are Mike Green, uh, VP of Strategic Development and Alliances at Brightcov, and Philippe Watermund, Media Executive at Watch4. Uh, I will let them give you more details about their role and companies right after the market overview. Uh, and we'll start the discussion that should last around 30 minutes with an additional 10, 15 minutes at the end for the questions and answers. Uh, so if you have questions, you can type them down uh, and they will be answered at the, at the end of the, the session. So to start uh, looking at the market trends, so here we're using uh, world aggregated data, but uh, it should still give uh, an idea of the main trends that were observed in the industry and uh, give some background for the discussion that is coming. First, uh, and it's an observation that must have been made by most people uh, in the audience, um, the SVOD and OTT video consumption in general are surging uh, all over the world. The quantity of videos that are watched online has been increasing at a tremendous pace. And here we have an overview of uh, only one part of it, the paying part with the uh, SVOD and OTT Pay TV subscribers. Uh, we see that they surged and reached uh, 920 million worldwide. And this growth is uh, quite impressive when compared to uh, the number of Pay TV subscribers uh, that we also see on the chart. And here we are not counting the, the free uh, viewers, the AVO viewers, uh, they're not included in the chart. In the chart. But we can also uh, still mention that um, even if the comparison uh, is interesting, we usually have uh, several uh, OTT services while uh, households have uh, usually only one pay TV subscription. Uh, if we look at the split by region, uh, we have a better idea of the weights of each region. So uh, we observed several things. Uh, the high discrepancies between uh, subscribers and revenues for uh, the uh, Asia Pacific region. Uh, they concentrate a large share of subscribers because of the size of the populations uh, in, uh, in countries of Asia Pacific, um, but revenues uh, are less high because uh, outputs are generally low and because uh, the streaming markets in Asia are showing a preference for free content for advertising based uh, video content. Uh, on the uh, other end of the scope we see Africa and Middle East that uh, globally remain untapped markets even though the numbers are on the rise. Uh, the, we can say that the trends are not as sharp as they are in uh, the most advanced, re advanced regions, uh, North America and Europe. Uh, and these two regions are the regions that weigh the most in terms of revenues, platforms uh, and penetration. And it's where SVOD platforms are the most attractive 
also because of the prices of video content in uh, in these regions and the habit to to pay for it so it's not only uh, on the demand side that things are uh, evolving we see that uh, the offer is expanding uh, also tremendously and this is highlighted here with the rise of uh, the number of platforms that uh, that are launched uh, every year which was the example of North America uh, and we we see that we counted uh, 92 OTT and SVOD platforms in 2019 from 84 in 2018 uh, only uh, 34 uh, AVOD platforms uh, uh, were active in uh, 2019 uh, from 28 in 2018. So we see that we have uh, more and more viewers, but also more and more choice. Uh, and this counts, this increase of uh, offers and services is uh, something that uh, we see in all the regions. Uh, it's what we see in the second chart. Uh, and on these models, uh, the specificities, uh, the distinctive uh, challenges of uh, SVOD and AVOD platforms, uh, Philip should be able to give us more information during the, the session. But what we can already say that the, the, the disintermediation of the value chain in OTT has led to a multiplication of actors, uh, of content providers that can now go directly to their consumer uh, and offer their content without having to deploy a uh, traditional distribution infrastructure uh, like cable or satellite, for instance. Uh, we also um, wanted to briefly show the, uh, the market shares, the global market shares by platform. Uh, so we see that if uh, there is a fragmentation of the market uh, with hundreds of platforms being launched, uh, we still have a strong domination of some global players. Uh, in terms of subscribers, we see that uh, we have mostly uh, North American and uh, Chinese actors. The OTT content uh, is also reaching more viewers because uh, the devices that uh, are used enable such consumption. So smartphones first that uh, became ubiquitous and uh, are the most used device to access the internet in some regions, uh, in Middle East and Africa, for instance, and some parts of Asia. And uh, tablets have a lesser penetration um, because it also competes with smartphones in, in some cases. Uh, but what we see is uh, on the second chart, uh, the number of smart TVs is uh, growing rapidly and it reached close to 800 million in 2020. And this represents around 31% of households worldwide. So uh, we observe that the TV sets uh, sold are mostly smart TVs now. Uh, they are expected to uh, progressively replace the TV set, the current TV set installed base. Uh, and, uh, and we can also mention uh, the growth of streaming sticks like uh, Comcast or Roku, for instance, that also enable advanced functionalities uh, on uh, TV sets. Uh, and this means that uh, um, uh, advanced functionalities are more and more uh, spread uh, and uh, we are talking about the ability to distribute applications, uh, the cloud re recording for instance, or uh, advanced uh, search functionalities uh, within catalogs. Uh, so being able to address smart TVs uh, became essential now for uh, the content providers, uh, for the platforms that launch their uh, OTT D2C offers. And to conclude uh, this short overview, uh, we see that in the last quarter, the growth has been even more acute in, uh, in all regions. And uh, this seems to have been a consequence of the sanitary measures that were implemented around the world. And here our panelists will be able to give us more details uh, and to cover the free distribution as well. Webinar, I'm Mike Green, VP of Strategic Alliances and Development at Brightcove. Um, been a seven-year veteran of Brightcove. If you're not familiar with Brightcove, it's the leading provider of cloud-based services for uh, distributing and managing video across any device and monetizing that video. And we're very lucky to have uh, great customers around the world, including in Europe, uh, and including uh, Philip, who's uh, joined us from, from Watch4. So Philip, I'll let you uh, introduce yourself and uh, your role and some of the 
background on, on Watch 4 and why you're a great fit for this discussion. Absolutely. Um, thanks, Mike. Yeah, my name is Philip Rodermont. I'm, I'm CEO of Video Solutions AG, uh, a Swiss-based company. Um, we run the AVOD uh, portal watch4.com and w4free.com as well as Turk on Video. Uh, we've been in the market since about uh, four years. Um, and um, so we're primarily focusing ourselves on, on AVOD portals in uh, the German-speaking region as well as in the UK. As I said, watch4.com is our uh, German-speaking portal and w for free the one which we are using in the UK. Um, we've been able to grow that service um, over the last couple of years to, to over 40 million monthly visitors and, and uh, way above 30 million video views on a monthly basis. Um, and uh, um, thanks to, to Brightcove, um, we are at this point um, today. Um, next to our Avod portals, we also run a, a Turkish-speaking escort service called uh, Turk on Video, and this is obviously targeting the Turkish-speaking diaspora across the world. Um, it's really a worldwide portal um, outside Turkey, obviously, where we're featuring like um, you know the best movies and Turkish drama series out there. Um, at this point, we originally wanted to show a video, but I guess with this connection today, we we leave the video away. That's um, I think. Um, Otherwise, the whole conservation going to break down. But um, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell, that's that's what we're doing. Mike, Great, Philip. If, yeah, and if we're if we're able to, if we end up having the opportunity, maybe we'll be able to show the video later as a, as a break in the action, just to give people really the flavor of all that you're doing. Yeah, because the content is absolutely. high quality stuff. You know, content that people recognize from all around the world that you've licensed for the service in the various markets in which you uh, distribute. Um, so thanks for that overview. Some some great brands there, and, and congrats on the on the growth and success of those brands so far. I'd love to hear a little bit about where you get into the strategy of you know what brands you have and why you've chosen to go after those markets in the way you have, and what devices your service is on, uh, the content strategy, and a bit of that. Um, let's just start off with kind of what the data that that we just seen from Data Access was talking about the growth in the market overall and some of the growth in COVID. Um, so uh, in the COVID era, uh, you know, Brightcove also has a, has a video index that we use to kind of track consumption across all of our customers um, in an aggregate manner to help give advice on um, trends that people should be looking to take advantage of and so forth. Um, but uh, can you comment before we get into some of those data points about the, the time that you've seen uh, during the, sorry, 2020 COVID era, how has that impacted the growth trajectory of your services in the various markets? Um, I mean, I guess since, you know, every OTT server, as well as like traditional linear television, everyone had a had a huge um, upscale in, in in viewing times and in the users, and that that was that was the same for us. We've we've been seeing um, um, uplifts up to thirty five forty percent uh, during the lockdown days and months, basically, and we still see a high usage. People are still at home, um, you know, being in home office, working from home office here. So um, that that is that is still that is still the case, um, and that, that was the positive trend for us. On the other hand, since our besides from Turk on Video, our main business is advertising funded, we also have just seen a massive decline uh, in advertising sales um, due to the fact like the tourism industry, obviously, you know, where they want to make any advertising and the car manufacturers and so forth. So um, you know, there was a very positive trend, obviously, in terms of reach and growth uh, of users, but on, on the revenue side, it was rather um, a problematic times and we are, we're happy to looking into Q4 where we obviously see some stronger uh, fill rates and higher CPMs than we had the last couple of months. Got it. And so before we get to some of the specifics about growth and the various mm. uh, devices you're on and so mm. forth, can you just share with people what devices the various services uh, are available on today? And other um, distribution points too. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Currently, we are available on iOS. I mean, like desktop, um, obviously, iOS, Android, Apple TV. We are on uh, Roku. We are about to launch um, Samsung TV as well as Amazon Fire and Android TV. Um, that's um, scheduled for the next, let's say, 10 days. Um, and that's what we call our owned and operated world. And that goes for Watch 4 w 3 as well as the Turk on Video. And on the, on the other hand side, one um, big challenge what, what we had on our agenda apart from COVID this year that we um, wanted to, that's how we call it, like our distribution or, or syndication business. So it means um, being on third parties. So, so we managed to make deals with uh, Xumo, um, Relax TV, um, we're on Huawei Video, we're on the Swisscom TV box. Um, we will launch in Deutsche Telekom late, uh, late October. 
um, that's the schedule at this moment. And then obviously we are in ongoing discussions with uh, the big cable operators in our core markets, such as um, Virgin, um, uh, Vodafone, uh, Unity, KBW, and so forth, the German speaking territories. Um, mm -hmm. So they are all on our roadmap. Um, as I said, our core business is free. Um, consider ourselves a free TV station. That means we need a maximum amount of distribution. You know? So if someone turns any device, turns on any device, you know, watch for should be on that. So that that is kind of our strategy. And for the carriage agreements you've cut, you said you've been busy working with Deutsche Telekom and others uh, to get distribution in a lot of different markets. Uh, mm. How is the kind of balance with your presence in those markets from an O&O &O perspective? Do they care about that? Does it actually kind of draw their attention to what you're doing and how the content is great and make it more tempting for them to want to carry the channel? Yeah, I think, you know, um, taking Deutsche Telekom as a, as a perfect example uh, uh, or any other of the, the bigger telcos or, or, or cable operators, I think like two years ago, um, we never would have the chance to to make a deal with them. It's very important that you can show your own apps. Obviously, from a content lineup, it, you, you need to have, to have some relevance. I mean, it's like, um, you know, like a handful of movies and TV shows. Uh, um, it's it's pretty, how should I say? It's uh, it's pretty tough to, to cut those deals. Um, but, you know, we've been growing um, over the years and, and are more mature now and the, the lineup is pretty nice. So. So I think the, the operators see the relevance in, in having us on board. Mm -hmm. Maybe it'd be helpful actually for you to tell a little bit about the timeline of the company. The company is not that old. You're not a legacy cable channel that then went and made an OTT no. service. And so tell people about, yeah. about the story. Yeah, I mean, um, basically watchfire.com itself has been, um, has been launched. Actually prior Video Solutions AG was founded. Um, um, we, we, we did that in another entity. Um, uh, we did other VOD businesses at that time. Um, so this is about three and a half years ago. Uh, and then when we saw that, you know, the baby could start running, um, we, we founded Video Solutions AG in April 18. So the company is a little bit more than, than, than two years and the, the service of .com is, uh, is about three and a half years. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, we've, we're fairly young in the market, um, even though the team has been in, in the like television world for, for many years. I mean, I've been, I've been in the business for you know, 17 plus years. Um, Chris Sharp, one of my partners, um, he was a co-owner of uh, Cello Zone and Zone Vision, which has been sold to Liberty. He's in the market since 30 plus years. Um, and uh, one of our board members, Brad Schlatterer, he was um, um, a, a managing director of Telemünchen Group. He also has like 30 plus years um, in his career in this kind of business. So, so the whole team has been always, you know, uh, managing different TV channels, been in the distribution business and so forth. So um, it's a strong, um, strong old school TV guys um, being now in the, in the new digital world. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great for obviously all the relationships you need to get your distribution deals that you've been getting yes, and exactly, to get that yeah. content in the door. Um, just mm -hmm. on that, on that pit, can you talk about with that expertise, you obviously saw holes in the market to do certain things. You picked the Turkish market, for example, to make Turk on video. Why yeah. that? What research did you do to decide these are the right models and these are the right markets for you? I mean, our, again, our first platform was watch Four, which, which was free. And um, again, back at the, back at the days, we, we still had a, in German speaking, we had a platform, which was, you know, which was s player even before Netflix called watch ever. Uh, a, a venture with uh, Vivendi, and they've been really strong at the time, but no one really was looking into the Award world. And, and we, from the beginning, had the feeling that that um, yes, everyone was talking at that time about Netflix. Uh, no one thought about Disney and you know things like Paramount Plus and you know all these other players which are moving into the market. Uh, but at that time, at least in Europe, I know Tubi has been a little bit longer in the market as well as Pluto. But they've been focusing on the yes, but in Europe there wasn't really you know any player. I mean, obviously we always have to consider YouTube uh, as some kind of a competition which is more user generated, and then we have to catch up services of the TV stations. But um, uh, apart from that, really no one. There was no real Avod player out there, and, and and we've been from the beginning very had the strong belief um, as what is pay TV, but someone has to take care about the free TV customers who, who do not want to watch linear TV anymore. They want to be their own program director. And that's that's when we basically launched Watch 4. And on the way, we saw, you know, um, you know living, I'm, I'm German living in Switzerland, but 
but knowing that we have a huge group of Turkish people living in Germany, um, which is about four and a half million, we always thought that there's, there's actually nothing for them besides the pay TV channels, which are distributed into cable within the territories. And then we did some research and we figured out there's about you know, 40 and a half million Turks living abroad. And it's, you know, four and a half million being in the German speaking territories that's in our core market. It's a, okay, that's, that, is, that is a pretty easy pitch actually. Uh, to launch something um, in particular for this community. Mm -hmm. And that's how we came up with Stuck on Video, basically. So you have a unique view into the market being a manager of paid services and free services, and some of them that are more generalist and some of them that are more targeted. How has coronavirus impacted the different types of services that you run? And I can see an argument where some people would think, um, you know, SVOD is under pressure because people are feeling un you know, insecure about their jobs or the economy and they're not paying for services. Or as you point out, the other side, you know, it could be any number of factors that are impacting whether AVOD or SVOD are in a better place in this environment. What are you seeing? I mean, I, I wouldn't say there's, there's any better place, but I think, I mean, there have been a, a lot of research studies out there um, for the UK as well, for, for German speaking. These are the main markets we, we, we're looking at at the moment. Um, and and, and they, they ask many people about, you know, how many, you know, how much money you want to spend on, on entertainment or on SVOD. And, and both in the UK and in Germany, it was around 22 euros. So, you know, having Netflix and, and then probably like a sports subscription, like The Zone or Sky, you've been already eaten up, you know, um, basically your budget um, from, a, from a statistical point of view. And of, of course, you need an internet connection. You want to have your Spotify or your Apple Music and, and so on. And then there are other services like Disney Plus and, and, and others coming to the market. So. Yes, I think there's a, there's a limit of amount of uh, subscription service in the European territories. I mean, in the US, naturally people been always spending like a hundred bucks per month on, on pay TV. That, that is nothing unusual, whether in, in Germany, for at least as well as in the UK, it's different. So, so I think there's a limited amount of, of services a, a single subscriber will have, but the demand for more content and for entertainment in particular during this lockdown time is, um, is more vital than ever, and 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 therefore the, the, we see a big chance for the award world. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And people obviously who are getting unique content that you can offer, like Turk on Video, they are willing to pay. We often exactly. uh, do yeah. research in this area to be able to advise customers. One of the questions we had done research on recently was around mm -hmm. how many people would be willing to, I guess, take ads uh, in exchange for a reduction in the cost of their SVOD service. Mm -hmm. And only about, I was surprised, only about 28% said that that would be something they'd want to do. So people who yeah. have like a really passionate, you know, service they're going to spend a lot of time with seem to be okay with maybe taking it uh, as a paid service. Um, exactly, yeah. So you, let's circle back to, you mentioned a great number of the distribution deals you're working on and some of the devices that you're on right now. What are you noticing about the growth in your consumption across devices? And I mentioned the, the video index that we published, which looks at, and people want to look at that at some brightcove.com, search for the video index. We talk about device uh, trends. And actually in the course of this year, I was a little bit surprised by this um, with so many people staying home due to COVID, but it's actually that smartphones with a 69% growth year over year is the fastest growing uh, in terms of overall consumption of the various devices that we've bucketed and looked at. Uh, but quickly followed by connected TV, which I think was uh, 42% in one quarter and 59% in Q2, so overall about 49% growth in CTV for the break of customer base on the year. I know that mm -hmm. that's a big focus for you as you've been rolling out onto more connected TVs. What are you seeing in patterns for the various devices that your audience is on? Um, yeah, so, so for us, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to make a direct connection to like previous years because we mm -hmm. launched most of our, the first rollout of our apps was late 19 so you know we didn't have like a full year but obviously we've seen a we've seen a massive growth uh, across the the smart tv uh, i mean first of all across the uh, mobile devices um tablets and phones uh, so i mean in particular ios and android app but also also the the usage on our apple tv app um, has been has been pretty good um uh, through the lockdown times um, and then having said unfortunately or whatever that was at the time like the samsung app will launch soon as well as roku has been in the market now for two and a half or three weeks or something anything like that so um yeah, um but yes i mean obviously the ones we have we see a massive growth and a, a shift uh, users coming from desktop uh, to to our to our app world 
Got it. So, um, and now before we get more into your content strategy, I figured it would be helpful for folks to be able to see that, that trailer, which shows some of the great content that's on the service. It's always nice to have a break in our lives, spending so much time looking at people in boxes on our computer screens these days. Uh, let's take a, a quick uh, detour to have us see a bit about the uh, content in your services. Uh, Saiva, if you'd be able to play that. So again, we, we cut that short a bit just to be able to show all the places where the service is available, which is a very important marketing message for us to have for you guys out in the, in the market, right? But um, yeah, we could see some of the content that's in there. What is, what is the content strategy? You've often, uh, you've, you've compartmentalized in some ways the, the service by having Watch 4 Sports separate from, from Watch 4. Uh, and you know, you've done some live events of recent, but you haven't chosen to pay a lot for, for big sports rights, for example. Can you talk about what you're, what you're licensing? Yeah, I mean, I'm basically, um, so we have two worlds. It's what we call the W brands and then Turgo Video, obviously. Um, so Turgo Video is a pretty clear positioning. You know, we, we only take uh, Turkish originals uh, in Turkish language version that can be um, Turkish dramas or Turkish movies. But we are in particular strong on the movie side. Um, there's certainly other um, as for service in the market, which also rolled out outside Turkey now, such as Blue TV, which, which are stronger on the, on the episodic uh, type of content, but we are focusing a lot on on, on fiction movies and um, really have it's like the best productions out there. Um, some you know sometimes even co-productions with Warner Brothers and so on. And we have those movies three uh, six months after theatrical release, so that's very very early and uh, pretty unique for Esport. Um, so there's a very um, clear uh, positioning. And then Watch4.com and W for free. Um, Watch4 for, for Germany, W for free UK. Um, 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 maybe just also quick, the reason why we have different names is, is, is just a trademark issue. The, the brand Watch has been registered in the UK uh, by a competitor, so we couldn't use that. So that's the reason why we call W for free in the UK. Um, but in general, um, both services are, you know, they kind of look the same and, and they're scheduled the same. That means, you know, we're general entertainment, that's our focus. Um, we will have a, we already have a strong focus on, on crime and true crime uh, in, in the theory, uh, theory world as well as um, documentaries and um, in reality shows. And uh, in, the, in the movie world, we have a strong focus on action, um, horror, also some drama movies, but, you know, mostly like action, thriller, horror in, in this world and a slightly more male oriented uh, programming. And, that's probably because also, um, as you know, we have Sky Media as, as our exclusive ad sales house in the UK as well as in Germany. And um, for also from their sales proposition, they're probably more male oriented, more you know, adult male oriented rather than, 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 than women. So that's basically the, um, the reason for that. Got it. So you mentioned that, that, that important ad repping relationship you have with Sky and their ad sales. Uh, skill set and who they typically target from an audience perspective. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, monetization. Um, I, I think it's interesting, you know, in some cases people are able to watch services for free. In other cases, you ask your subscribers, even if they're not paying, to register to at least get some basic demographic information, even though that may introduce perhaps some friction into getting them to press play and start viewing. How do you think about uh, that challenge and the information you want to get about the audience for monetization? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> As of today, we, we always, uh, or our main proposition was it's completely free. So we have basically two models. So you, you, you go to the site or to the app and, and, and you consume, uh, and that's about it. Um, and then there was an upsell process where you can um, log on into a, a paid version, um, which first of all gives you features such as continue watching favorites and so on, but it's also ad free and then access to more exclusive content. That, that, is, um, that is as of, as of today. Now with the launch of the 
Beacon Apps, which is the, the front end product from, from Brightcove, we have like a, a three-step three -step process. So that means the completely free world as we have it today, but then also we give the user the possibility to register, but then already getting the features like continue watching across devices and favorites, but you don't pay for that. You still see ads at the same type, you know, amount. So it's a little, let's say, um, um, incentive, um, just giving your data. And then we just take, you know, a minimum type of data. It's like email address, um, gender and, and, and um, age group, you know, um, that's about it. Um, mm -hmm. We're thinking about zip code, but um, that's, that's still not, not decided yet. And then obviously the third one is again, the, the, the ad-free version, uh, which comes at 4.99 per month, uh, which is only available in Germany at this point. Um, again, gives you ad-free version and access to a few more shows and a few more movies than you have in the free version. Got it. But, um, but in general, really our, our concept is AVOD and that's where we want to want, want to stay. Um, this is just um, one feature for the super heavy users who mm -hmm. don't like to see the ads. Mm -hmm. Great. People start thinking of uh, questions because Saeva is going to handle a, a moderated discussion after uh, mm -hmm. Philip and I finish this little mini interview. Um, but let's ask one more question around just how you're drawing attention to the service. Obviously, you need scale in your audience to achieve a good AVOD model. How are you marketing the service? Where are you marketing the service? Do you market the paid version versus the free version separately in any fashion? Tell us about that strategy. Um, yes, I mean, um, coming back to the to the W brands, um, um, you know, we do all sorts um, of of mar online marketing. Um, you know, obviously anything around social. Um, um, we do um, basically um, buying ad space across like all kinds of websites. What we have done basically, we, which I always call my my advertising hedge fund, we we um, we developed an algorithm where we kind of profiling the users. Um, obviously alongside the GDLP compliant uh, guidelines. But uh, what we're doing, so um, just to give you a very easy example, let's say users from the Washington Post converting better than users from, um, you know, I don't know, the Daily Mirror, you know, something like that. You know, then the algorithm would save that data and is basically spending more money on Washington Post um, for us to, to bring the users. At the same time, he will also look at the C CPMs buying the user. Um, so, so he will register, let's say he buys at the Washington Post for 10 euros um, versus one euro at Daily Mirror, then he would figure out maybe the less good conversion rate is still cheaper than, than buying this Washington Post. Um, so basically we are connected to a DSP and then um, basically the, the, the algorithm is doing spend on, on that. And on the other hand side, the algorithm is checking the, the, the sales side. So, you know, when, once he good, sees good fill rates and good CPMs, you would spend more and so mm -hmm. forth. That's the, the, the basic concept. Obviously, we look into that manually, but um, through um, through that concept, we've been always able to get high quality users at a, at a very low price. Because you know, otherwise, if you if you go out there and spend money on television campaigns and and and, and you know, big display and so on, that's super expensive. And mm -hmm. you know, um, as I said, we're two and a half years old. We're still a startup. Um, we're we're not funded by any big VCs whatsoever. So we had to come up with smart models to, to do so, yeah. Good, sounds like you're doing a good exactly. job of linking your data sets to make these smart decisions to bring in profit. Exactly, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, great, well, Saeva, so I'll, I'll throw it back over to you. I'm sure there are people who've been uh, listening to what Philip's had to say and other comments around the kind of OTT environment and COVID and maybe has questions uh, for us or, or you may have some yourself. Yes, uh, yes, so for everyone, if you have questions, uh, don't hesitate to write them down. Uh, yes, I, I would like to comment on uh, the adver advertising market uh, and the size of the online advertising market and how it's evolved over the years. Um, so we've talked a lot about uh, Europe, so it would be also interesting to have uh, your views, uh, Mike, uh, maybe on uh, the North American market. Um, what's the current state of the online advertising market? How easy is it to work with brands uh, to, and to monetize the content uh, for online videos? Sure. I mean, I guess if I'll comment kind of broadly from where, where we sit and then Philip can talk about the market in, in his world and what his kind of very hands-on experience has been. Uh, look, there's no question that the growth in viewership in the first half plus of 2020 uh, has not been met by uh, additional dollars in advertising. And in fact, there's been a pullback as people have been concerned about the economic impact of COVID. And so that's been a struggle for a lot of, um, you know, 
content owners in terms of you know, fill rates to some degree. But uh, we've seen it starting to come back and certainly Q4 is the most important quarter for, um, for all of our you know, uh, media publishers and other content owners. Uh, and uh, I think people are somewhat optimistic in certain cases we've seen uh, you know, rebounds in committed spend and other stories like that. So uh, I think that the area that's been most under pressure has somewhat been where there's a generalist publisher, and I don't mean like in an OTT service, because actually the OTT market seems pretty healthy. I think there's been a lot of um, knowledge transfer to people who understand now how to buy connected television inventory or generally OTT inventory and how it's legitimate, uh, how, to, how to kind of weed out fraud in that market and feel confident making buys there with credible brands. So overall, the trend is very positive. I think there's just been kind of this shock to the system in the first half of the year. Mm -hmm. But it's recovering. And uh, Philippe, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, I mean, first of all, I mean, talking pre-COVID, um, I think, and, and that was for us really when we started the challenge to find the right partner who's who's able to monetize our inventory. Um, really, in the beginning, you know, we went through the open markets. Um, we had like smaller ad sales houses, no exclusivity whatsoever, and we always had the discussion um, with our advertising partners and saying, um, "Yeah, you, you're selling, you know, a pre-roll on whatever six year CPM on a low fill rate." Um, and you don't you don't make any difference between like a, a user generated thirty second video of a cat falling over and looking funny uh, to a multi million dollar production and that was really the biggest challenge in the beginning, and and that's the reason why I've been we've been so happy to find Sky Media as as an ad sales house, um, being obviously massively big in the UK but also a very strong partner for us in the German speaking regions because they understand television and and we see ourselves as television so so they respect in terms of ferrets and CPMs, the value behind the product. And they rather um, do the ads around the product rather than, rather than more like target audience. And I think that that is very important for an OTT service to find the right ad sales house, because otherwise it's going to be super hard to refinance the cost behind such a service. I saw one question around CDNs and marketing and, and, and so on. And, 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 that, and then the content, of course, which is one of the biggest, uh, uh, um, uh, just lines in our PNL, um, uh, you know, there needs some needs to be some revenue behind it. And then uh, Mike totally agree. COVID had now an impact. I think uh, um, Germany as well as UK they lost a billion um, to, to the previous years in, in, in spendings um, in, in the first half year. Yes, um, that is a problem, but I'm sure um, it will come back. I think. We will have a good Q4, whether that's over proportional, we're gonna, you know, if we talk in three months time, we will know. Um, but, you know, once world economy is, is coming slowly back on track, also the ad market will recover. Mm -hmm. And when we, talk to, uh, when we talk about the AVOD world, um, the tech giants and uh, big uh, social media platforms are uh, often uh, involved. Uh, and since you touched on partnerships uh, a bit earlier, but with devices, um, are you also working with these platforms uh, for distribution, uh, for promotion? How important are they uh, for platforms like uh, uh, Watch4 and Token Video? Um, you mean platforms like YouTube and Facebook, for example? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, from a monetization point of view, we don't use Google um, because um, then I'm, you know, I'm exactly back where I just said, you know, low CPMs and low fare rates, so even lower eCPMs. So that's that hasn't been a good strategy so far. In terms of marketing, um, we don't have any YouTube strategy whatsoever. Um, uh, we think, um, how should I say? Um, I think it, there are other companies out there similar to us, which, which have a very strong YouTube presence, historically speaking. And for them, it became a good business, even though CPMs and fair rates within the YouTube network are not great. Um, I think it's a big danger also because, you know, you kind of, dependent on YouTube. You know, um, if they, um, it's, can you still hear me? Um, we can still hear you. Your AirPods may have just uh, died out, but we hear you. Sorry? Good. Um, so I think that, that, is, that has, um, um, so th therefore we don't have any YouTube strategy. Obviously Facebook as a marketing tool is interesting to us, but it's not uh, the most important one. Um, because again, you know, you have to invest money that your Facebook channel is growing and then you have to bring the people to your site. So we've, we figured out, I mean, obviously we run a Facebook channel, we have uh, Instagram, we have Twitter, we do all the social marketing. Um, 
because it's um, kind of expected, um, uh, but it hasn't been like the biggest driver of users for us so far. Mm -hmm. And Mike, from what you observe uh, on your client base, is it an important part of the strategy for platforms? I, I think so. Most of our customers who are running OTG services, they're using what's called Brightcode Video Cloud as the backend where they ingest, uh, transcode, manage all their videos, and then publish them out to their various endpoints, whether it's apps across um, different devices or partner services and so forth. But while all that video lives in Video Cloud, oftentimes they're clipping things, making trailers or highlights, and using what we call Brightcove Social to publish those out to YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, and, you know, they can schedule those to kind of time them with, you know, promoting certain shows. I think that's a, a good strategy. I mean, additionally, I'm sure they are buying various, you know, keywords or buying maybe additional placements for, for some services. But there's that workflow for, for teasing content across the social platform seems to be best practice. And we help them by pulling back in analytics from those platforms, including you know, likes and shares and retweets and favorites and other stats that are unique to each of those platforms, they come back into the Brightcove Analytics uh, console so they can kind of gauge engagement with some of that content on the social platforms. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Um, so we're um, slowly getting close to the end of the session. Um, um, how do you see things uh, evolving uh, on the OTT world and uh, in particular uh, when we're talking about AVOD, do you think that it will become uh, more and more way, um, more and more important way of consuming uh, video content? Uh, as I shown, uh, show at, at the beginning, uh, more and more platforms are launching uh, both on the AVOD and SVOD world. So how do you see uh, this evolving? Uh, maybe Mike uh, to start? Sure. I mean, that's one of the hottest topics, of course, is what does sort of saturation look like for consumers with respect to SVOD. And um, there's plenty of room around those services uh, to have, you know, AVODs uh, sprouting up in various forms. Um, I really don't have the answer because I think across the customer base we have in OTT, there's very healthy ones uh, in both flavors. And there are ones who are running on Brightcove Beacon, which is the, you know, OTT platform that, uh, that Watch4 is using that have, you know, 100,000 customer base. That's a nice, healthy, you know, business. It's not Disney plus size or Netflix size, but like there's, there seems to be plenty of appetite if you've got a unique value proposition and great content to be healthy in SVOD. That said, I would say the majority of the newer ones we've seen have at least gone to the market as, as AVOD in the last, I don't know, um, if I were to look at over the last year, people who, who've joined us running a new OTT service, I would say it's to use AVOD. Mm -hmm. uh, and Philip, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, um, I have to say that AWOT is a kind of the future that is our main business model now. But I, what I said earlier, there have been there have been uh, several researchers out there. You know, the, the the demand for more content is there. That, that there's no question about it. It's enough content available. Um, so um, so people want to watch more, but they don't want to necessarily pay more. And I think that that is a big chance here for for players um, like us, but also others. And um, if you look at the recent trade deals um, been happening in, in the M and A world, you know, you know, um, companies such as Pluto being sold for like three hundred plus million, uh, what is it, eighteen months ago or something? Uh, at the time, I think they they had the size what we have today, and then you know, Fox uh, acquiring Tubi for five hundred million. I, I, you kind of see there's a, there's a massive interest from from big networks. Um, being part of the A world world because it does definitely. I wouldn't say it replaces linear TV, but it it, it will be. Uh, a major addition, a major threat to, to, to the core television business, really. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's uh, take some questions from the audience. So, a uh, question from Nino Petovec. Hi, Philip. I imagine you're using cloud-based CDN to deliver the content in different markets. How are you managing costs regarding bandwidth? Uh, uh, you know, thanks for the question. I, I always can give that back to Mike and uh, to my negotiations with Brightcove. Yeah. Um, um, but um, no, but um, yes, we, we're using Brightcove. Um, um, literally, I, I would say for ninety percent uh, of our technology needs. So that means not only front ends, players, um, um, the the OBP itself, but also the CDN comes from Brightcove. And I guess you guys are buying from you know um, classic uh, partners such as Akamai and so forth. And since we are already able to commit quite high volumes, um, I guess our costs are, are quite uh, um, good or, you know, the, the rates we're getting from Bycroft are, are definitely um, competitive. Um, but uh, Mike, I'm, I'm happy that you also say some, some words to that. 
Well, you know, it's a good question. It's an important question. Um, and for a company like Brightcove, who can aggregate the scale of all of our customers, we can definitely buy CDN from the leading providers, Akamai, Fastly, Amazon, you know, others, and get the lowest possible rates to be able to pass those on to our customers rather than if each individual customer at the scale they're operating at was having to have those conversations. But one of the important pieces, I think, of, of Brightcove's sort of um, multi-CDN approach is ensuring that delivery is optimized for any given region, uh, for any given content type, for any given network connection, or whatever it is. Like, there's a strategy there to um, basically uh, have have all the right connectivity, you know, for providers, including CDNs, to uh, optimize delivery, optimize end user experience for our customers. We have another question from Ahmed Sahin, and I guess it's for uh, Philip. Turkish episodic content is the longest in duration per episode compared to the world. How are audiences in Europe reaction to such long episodes? Yeah, that's something what we had to learn, you know, when we got like, the, you know, the, I think we have one series with not only the episode length was like it's 90 minutes uh, or even longer at some times. And then we figure oh, yeah, but well, they have like 700 episodes. I said, that's, <laughs> that's quite amazing. Um, since we're, you know, targeting the Turkish speaking people um, uh, living abroad from, from, from Turkey, they're used to that. So we are, you know, we don't have any language versions on it. It's, it's original uh, language version. So I can't really say how um, Europe is reacting to it because obviously um, someone who, who's used to watch Turkish television, he's used to the length. So, so there's no um, relearning for us here. Um, but I guess um, if, if you look at Turkish drama in general, it has become one of the, um, I think in, in dollar export, um, Turkish dramas are, are number two now behind uh, the US. So, so I guess people accept these kind of links and in particular in Latin America, it wasn't unusual to have long lasting um, telenovelas and so forth. Uh, 